Well, in case you missed it, I just said good afternoon and welcome to the Pivoting a Product and Innovation webinar presented by Pinnacle Tourism Marketing. My name is Sophie Formica and thank you once again for joining us, particularly those of you who were able to be with us last week for our first webinar in this series. It's my great pleasure to be facilitating once again a conversation with some really experienced people in tourism who are really here to help you through this very challenging and unique time. So today's webinar is the second in a series of four webinars in the Queensland Tourism Industry Business Capability Development Year 3 program, COVID-19, Restarting, Transitioning and Resilience. The program is going to be offered over two stages. First, in the four key business activities that have been identified to help Queensland tourism businesses prepare for reopening. So stage one is this one, where we have four webinars for you that are going to take place once a week up until the 5th of August. And these will be available to all tourism, travel and industry operators across the state. The recorded webinars will be available for you to be able to have a look at at any time on the QTIC website. Stage two will then include of up to four sessions of 60 minute one-on-one -on -one online coaching sessions. These are going to be available to eligible tourism and hospitality businesses that have participated in or have viewed one or more of the four webinars. The Queensland Government has allocated $3 million to fund and deliver this Tourism Industry Business Capability Development Program for the tourism industry over a three year period from August 2018 through to June 2021. So let me introduce to you our panel today. We have Michael Nelson joining us. Michael is the owner and managing director of Pinnacle Tourism Marketing. He has over 20 years experience in the industry, occupying senior roles within sales and marketing departments of some of tropical North Queensland's most iconic tourism products, including Great Oceans, Great Adventures Outer Reef and Island Cruises, the Five Green Star Green Island Resort, and Jabakai Aboriginal Cultural Park. After starting his own business in 2006, the company then evolved to become Pinnacle Tourism Marketing, which now represents over 20 SMEs and helps them navigate through the dynamic world of tourism distribution, sales and marketing. You'll hear today that Michael has been very busy over the last few months. He's also run and been a part of a significant um, number of mentoring programs right throughout Queensland and Pinnacle Tourism Marketing are one of the business coaching organisations that will be a part of this QTIC program. Also joining us we have James Munro who has over 30 years experience in the industry, a unique background. He's worked in senior positions for key wholesale companies in Australia including Qantas Holidays, AOT Group, Flight Centre and now Ignite Travel Group. James also has extensive experience on the other side of the fence. He's held senior sales positions for some of Australia's leading hotel companies, including Hilton International, Mantra Group and Ridges Hotels and Resorts. And finally, Bram Collins. Now, Bram was born in Cairns, and raised on a cattle station in the remote, beautiful Gulf Savannah region of northern Queensland. He started working in the tourism industry in the early 90s when his family developed the Andara experience became a savannah guide and has conducted tours then at the Andara Lava Tubes. He has incredibly extensive experience in many facets of the tourism industry from operational management issues through to event organisations, marketing, sales, promotions and dare I say a lot of the creativity that goes behind the products as well. He's also the owner of Andara Experience and a motivational speaker with his business success with attitude. So thank you gentlemen for sharing a little time and a little wisdom with us this afternoon. Michael, we've talked so much and I think that if we all had a dollar for every time we hear the word pivot, it would help us through this period. Um, can you, as I said, you've been really busy over the last four months and you've worked with a lot of companies very closely. What are the, some of the things that you think that you could share with us that you've really taken out of the experience to date? I think the first one is, Sophie, is that we're actually going to kick the word pivot to the curb. At, um, <laughs> if I hear that word again, um, it's been uh, a word that, yeah, well, wow, we've heard so much. And um, yeah, just like COVID, I think I'd like to see the end of that one too. But I think when we started writing the content for this presentation, we actually just wanted to take this from a really practical point of view. Um, we wanted to sort of like say, um, this has been our learning from the last, you know, three and a half, four months. Um, and just try and give people some really practical insights into 
um, just how we've sort of like managed this whole event and are still managing this whole event. Um, and I think just to give some background, you know, at, at back in March, um, you know, we saw a systematic shutdown of every single market that was available to us. Um, it was something that we'd never experienced before in tourism. Um, we've always had something there that we could go to, um, but we'd never seen a complete shutdown of every single market that was available um, to us. We had um, back then and still do now have over 20 businesses that, um, that had significant visibility in the international market. So we, we knew that we would have to do some, some things fairly radically um, to realign these businesses into different markets to try and emerge them um, from COVID. Um, and that's really the, I guess, the, the angle that we're taking um, from this presentation today is to give, as I said, some people some really practical insights into, um, into what we've done and hopefully that's applicable to them as well. So when you started from the very beginning, what were some of the first things that really needed to be talked about, identified and worked through? Um, I think that uh, one of the first things we do, and I've actually just tried to nail this down into a couple of points here. We want to slip onto the next slide. That's not coming down, probably playing a little bit of catch up. In any case, we had five points that we, um, that we actually had, um, that we actually knew that we had to. And the first one was that it was really a need to understand our customer. Um, uh, you know, the next point that we had was that we knew that we had to be incredibly nimble and light footed as we were starting to come through. Um, we had to understand, really understand our business and where the line was in the sand, where we stopped and started making money because we knew that we would have to be pretty efficient in terms of what we were pushing out to the market. But with all that being said, and as we were sort of like really going hard at it, um, we also knew that we needed to, to maintain a connection with our existing audience. We couldn't just throw those guys out with the bathwater. We knew that we needed mm. to maintain that connection. So there were four points that we really did, um, that we did actually have, um, that we sort of like nailed down um, with, uh, with our learnings out of this particular event. Now, you mentioned, you know, right from the outset that a lot of these businesses really do rely very heavily on an international market. So in a lot of cases, I imagine it's fair to say that you have to talk to a new customer, engaging on with an audience that perhaps you, you haven't really had to put a lot of investment into up until this time. Absolutely. And whether it was a new customer or whether it was a market that maybe wasn't a huge part of our business moving forward, um, it, was, it, it was one of those two scenarios. So like never before, we've had to develop an understanding of where our customers, um, guests or passengers, depending on the product that you've got, where they are and how can we actually talk to them. Um, you know, we've had to develop new ways of reaching that audience. Um, and I think had to develop a very immediate understanding of what's going to motivate them to travel and then absolutely um, cultivate an offering to meet that need. Um, and that's something that is, um, you know, we're, we're really seeing some micro audiences that have actually come out of this event. And I think that that's a big learning that we've taken out of that as well. Um, benchmarking ourselves on the past um, in terms of what customers have been motivated to come to our product um, before is not a particularly productive thing right now. Um, in, quite, in fact, it's quite a sobering thing because that's just not what we're seeing is really motivating them at this particular point in time. What are you seeing motivate them? Well, I guess that, um, you know, it, it comes down to the, the offer, you know, in North Queensland, I'll give you a practical example of that one, Sophie. Um, in North Queensland, um, we had a lot of products that had minimum night stays and things like that on their product. But the, one of the first markets that opened up to us was actually the local market. And we knew that they didn't have three nights up their sleeve. So we had to throw that out the window. We had to start again. We had to start introducing single night, single night stays to actually motivate them to travel. We knew that our local economy up here had been incredibly hard hit um, in terms of just people's disposable income. So we had to mm. curate offers to actually meet that need as well. And I guess that's what we're talking about, of having the understanding and not necessarily what has worked for you in the past is going to work for you 
in this particular event right now. It's not to say that it's not going to work in the future, but where we are sitting right now, you do need to be really open and totally mm. flexible to say, who's my audience right now? How can I talk to them and what's going to motivate them? You mentioned having to be nimble, this idea of being you know, light on your feet. And in reality, so many of us in business are making decisions based on what we know right now when we also understand that we can only predict so much about what the future may look like. There is always this need to have a fluidity with the choices that are being made. In terms of the tourism industry, how have you been able to prepare for different markets opening up and perhaps then retreating a little and opening up again? Can I tell you, this has probably been our biggest learning um, out of this whole event. It's the ability to be light on your feet. Um, I think we can all relate to the uncertainty that's gone around this event. Um, we're sort of like saying, right, give us a date. Um, then we've had other dates thrown at us. Um, then we've had other announcements where markets have opened up with very little notice um, given to us to say, right, you know, this is, this is where we're standing right now. Um, and we're still not through this, Sophie. You know, as we sit here right now, um, you know, where we were four weeks ago, we would have hoped that we probably would have seen the Victorian market travelling to us. It's not going to happen for a little while. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing some commentary about um, cases in New South Wales and what might happen with that. We are not through this roller coaster. So the ability to be able to have offers that are ready to go and to be able to go out to meet the markets that are available to us is absolutely essential. And I think that's the planning part of what we uh, what we can come to. We can't look too far forward because we are really marketing in the moment, I think, right now. But I think we can have a structure around us. And I should have pointed out as well that um, in the presentation, we've actually just given everyone some, some pretty comprehensive handouts as well. Um, and in that, um, we've put together just like a, a small little marketing plan where people can actually cultivate their offers for different markets so that when these markets um, start to open up, you know exactly what you're going to offer. And I think that's so important. And I guess for a lot of people, when, when we hear the starter's gun, if that's your catalyst to like get moving, then you could be a little bit behind the eight ball um, in terms of being out there and being able to be exposed out into the market as well. And I think, yeah, that, as I said, major learning. That difference between um, being able to be proactive rather than just reactive when these things are changing. There are so many variables. You talk about the ability to, you know, it says there on the, on the slide to have channels of distribution ready to be able to reach those audiences as they come online. You know, this importance of making sure that your preparedness is, is in, in all facets of the business, right? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, as we're, we're, we're talking predominantly now the domestic market, you know, that's really the market that we've, we've really only got to talk to. There's been lots of conversations about, you know, New Zealand and everything like that. It's, it's not in our scope just right now. The market that we've got to talk to is the domestic market. But within the domestic market, there's also all these micro audiences. There's smaller breakdowns. And the channels of distribution that I'm referring to there allow you to talk to those micro audiences um, in a very, very different way as well. Um, and as we go through this little webinar, we'll, we'll actually have a bit of a chat about, you know, what's what's available to you. And I know James from Ignite's got some great insights um, into what they're up to as well. So today we're talking about pivoting a product and innovation, this ability to be able to change and innovate as you go. What is it about innovation and change? Have you seen some really great examples of this? Yeah, look, I think before we get to that, though, I think the need to understand your business is a fundamental in this one, Sophie. Um, you know, the, the understanding of um, what I say here in our office is, is the line in the sand where we start making money and stop making money. You know, how far you can go, how yeah. deep you can go with the distribution channels is a very individual thing for each product. So I think that that's an essential that you need to understand your pricing strategy and what you're doing and where you're going out into the market. But I think in terms of innovation, goodness me, we've seen some enormous examples of innovation. Um, I guess the first thing that we see is just in the way that we're actually doing business. 
um, four or five months ago, I would have been delivering this seminar in a room full of people um, standing up here, um, standing up here live. Um, you know, this is how many webinars have we now done? The fact that we're now seeing, um, you know, digital payments as just an ongoing way of life that potentially is actually overtaking cold hard cash through necessity because people actually don't want to touch cash anymore. So mm -hmm. these are just some of the examples in terms of, um, you know, when we're actually starting to see innovation and that's technological innovation. But I think as well, there's innovation that we can absolutely do in terms of um, uh, the guest experience as well. And I think that's also where I'm seeing some great examples of innovation in terms of where people are actually innovating to, um, to improve their guest experience. And I'll give you some examples of that shortly, but um, in terms of just what people are up to, but that's mm. really what we're seeing as well. The people that are recognizing that there's a new market to talk to and that potentially they need to innovate and change their guest experience to meet that market, I think is also something that we've seen and come out of. Um, and I'll give you a really practical example of that. We had, um, I know of a product up on the Atherton Tablelands that right at the start of this, uh, they had heavy exposure in the international market. And they said, right, but we're, we're quite a, an isolated place um, and we can give people some real security around um, being safe from COVID. So they actually started to promote themselves as a really long stay place um, where you could escape the COVID threat. And that was just an example of someone just totally changing their whole product alignment to meet where COVID was actually, uh, where COVID was actually taking them. Yeah, it does certainly seem that there's, um, there's, there's little reluctance at the moment to find yourself in an area where there aren't a lot of other people around and we have an abundance of those experiences in this state. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's what we've got. You know, we're going to be perceived even more so even within Australia as a very safe destination as well. So that's just one of the marketing elements that we can capitalise on to again change and realign our products, um, you know, innovate our guest experience to meet that as well. Um, and I know that we put out a marketing campaign um, that was social distance North Queensland style because we know that we've actually got the space that people mm. are craving while still wrapping that up into an actual experience as well. So, and I think that that's, um, again, just another learning that we've been open to. And I think that if I could sum up this part of it in, in, in just one statement, Sophie, it's the fact of don't be afraid of change. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we've actually got is, is um, if you've been bogged down in saying, well, we've never done that before and been reluctant to do it, open mm. yourself up to the fact that you may need to just adapt a little bit. We're not saying that you need to radically change everything, but you need to be open to it. So open to it, adapt if required to meet this market that we can actually, uh, that we can actually talk to at the moment. Just one thing before we move on, Michael, as you were talking, I was just thinking you work with so many different businesses. Have you met a reluctance at this time or, or an idea that perhaps some operators feel like there is cost involved or it's costly at a time when everybody is looking more closely at, 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 at the bottom line and dollars in and dollars out, that you can actually do a lot without having to spend a lot? Absolutely. And I think it's just about working smarter. Um, you know, we've I've seen one example of it, and uh, if we have time this afternoon, I'm actually going to speak to it. But we know of a resort um, that actually took their restaurant and totally just changed the experience within the restaurant. The same tables and chairs and everything like that, mm. but they actually just changed the experience that people and guests were actually coming to because they wanted to give um, their restaurant its own identity um, and they wanted to make that part of the guest experience. So they haven't thrown thousands of dollars of capital expenditure at this. They've just changed how they're actually talking about it um, and for, for very little cost in terms mm. of doing that. And I think, again, just really, really smart stuff. I'm going to invite Bram to come back along and join us from Andara. Um, Bram, this next area that we're going to talk to is one that 
um, is certainly really important to, to where you are, and that is the drive market. It would seem at the moment that that is being promoted very heavily. It's certainly predominant. Um, how significant has the drive market been for you and Andara? Well, Sophie, as uh, you said in your introduction, you, you know, we opened in 1990, so we've been social distancing for 30 years out in the outback, but um, we, uh, our drive market is our major market. And, you know, I'm just listening to some of the things that you and Michael are, were talking about. Uh, when people think drive, um, it's a really diverse uh, marketplace with many different um, sectors within it. You've got people that fly in, hire a car, and then, you know, do, do drive trips like you might if you went to Tasmania. Uh, we uh, get lots of grey nomads through, um, uh, through Andara and motorhome, motorhome, so internationals that would come in and maybe hire a, uh, a Brits Maui van in Cairns and drive with the Savannah Way all the way to Broome. Uh, and then you've got the family, the budget market, where you've got young families out, parents with their kids, you know, wanting to have a bush experience. So these are all very different markets. And so if you're going to pivot uh, to to attract a new market, be very clear on what the market is that you're pursuing. You've got to understand it and make sure that the product that you offer is suitable for that market. Uh, and then most importantly, there's got to be a story. Um, the story is so critically important. I heard Michael talking about experiences before. Experiences are a story and no one can tell your story better than you can. And um, if you want to have a successful product, I think it's about being the best storyteller uh, that you can possibly be. Uh, your story is your story and you know our story at Andara is unique to us mm. and I think if we've learned anything in the last 30 years it's been how to tell that story in an engaging way where we can where we can uh, you know bring people in and because we're in a remote area you know we um, we tend to try and package up other experiences in our region which adds to a regional story and and it makes the whole region more appealing because uh, it's a long way to go to experience one product. But if you can experience a wide array of products and have a regional experience, then you're guaranteed a more enjoyable experience for the family. And let's face it, in a time like today where we have challenges with uh, our income, um, when you put together a regional package, be they packaged or itineraries, even suggested itineraries, the, you know, the government, state and federal, they, both, they all look at these as great growth opportunities and they like to throw a few dollars toward, um, you know, programs that have regional benefits. So there's, you know, it opens the door to access grants and stuff. And I noticed in some of the handouts, there's a, example of a great regional itinerary on the Atherton Tablelands for people to have a look at. Michael, you know, Bram touched then on some of the stats. The data is certainly supporting the fact that many of us are planning on jumping in the car and having an adventure on four wheels. Absolutely, Sophie. And look, I pulled these um, these stats from, from Tourism Events Queensland. So, this is from December 2019, and this is just some highline statistics. I'm, I'm not a big on stats, but this is just to give you an idea on just how big the drive market is. 13.7 million people um, use drive as a component of their holiday in, in Queensland, um, which is actually astounded me actually when I started really drilling down into it. Um, and in the handouts, we've actually given a more of a breakdown in there in terms of different areas. Um, and what we found is certainly down in the southeast corner, um, it's big on drive, you know, people probably coming out of Brisbane, sort of like going down into the scenic rim, maybe heading up to the sunny coast, down to the Gold Coast. Um, and as you get further up the coast, it starts to um, drop down a little bit because we start to rely a little bit more on air capacity to sort of move us around the state because of our geographical expanse. But it's still a very, very, very significant part of, uh, of what we do and how we do it. 
Um, and I think that um, there was some questions actually from um, from some of the registrations to say, well, first and foremost, is there any um, science around um, the drive market sort of like being around for, um, you know, into the future? Is this going to be a major part of, of what we do? I think, I think we're already there. I think it is already a major part of what we are actually doing. Um, and there were some other questions there about recent trends, about motorhomes and things like that and people's, um, you know, propensity to use that to, again, maybe have a look at uh, that social distancing and staying safe while still having a great experience. Um, and I've just put a link up, which is also in the notes um, from TEQ, which is the link to all their more recent trends that they've seen since COVID has actually begun. And it's just observations and things like that as well, which maybe can start to help frame people up and give them some confidence about, um, you know, what the drive market is actually going to be as well. Graham, you've mentioned earlier that you guys are really busy at the moment, which is fantastic. Are you finding that the market has changed or have you got a lot of repeat visitors? Who is it that's an Andara at the moment? Um, it started out when we first opened in the end of June, Sophie, as being just our local market, and which was fantastic because for so many years I'd run into people and they'd say, oh, I'm Dara, yeah, I'm going to do that one day. And I thought, well, when they all do it, we're going to be really busy. And I think now is that one day because they've got very few other options of where to travel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it started out as this local market. Then as the, the travel restrictions were relaxed, it became our sort of interregional and then it just you could see it branching out and of course school holidays it was booked out four days in advance and so it's been great but there was one other thing that i wanted to add to what i was saying before if you are going to go into a uh, a new market for yourself one of the best things that you can do is measure measure uh, your return on your investment and I, I as a rule of thumb at andara we have a, uh, a, a return on investment expectation for every dollar we spend. And uh, and one thing that I have learned is you have very little control over your income, but you have 100% control over your cost management. And uh, become a master cost manager and measure everything. And if you're not getting the return on investment that you expect, go on to something better. Don't be don't be frightened to change because uh, the worst thing you can do is is do the same thing day after day expecting a different result you know that's definition of an insanity I insanity. think but um, yeah. but yeah that that's um, yeah thank you uh, Michael you know we mentioned earlier Bram said that they are very good at storytelling are there some really great examples of storytelling that you've seen in the industry or um, perhaps operators who've really jumped on board this idea of being ready for the drive market? Yeah, look, I think that, you know, Bram touched on it before, as you said, you know, the, the ability to tell your story, because I know there was a question in from, from, uh, from someone asking about how do we actually attract the drive market? Um, and I think the first answer to that question is you need to develop the hook. Um, developing your unique selling point um, is, is marketing 101, whether it's a destination, whether it's a product. So I think that that's the first thing is that you do need to develop your hook, um, the ability to develop or to tell your story, but then you need to wrap it up in the right color paper so that people can digest it um, in, in, the, in the way that you actually want them to as well. So again, I've seen some really, really clever stuff and I just put up a couple of shout outs, um, you know, for two products that I've just seen um, and well, they're both in North Queensland. There's no sort of like um, parochialism here or anything like that. But, sure, I think sure. that, um, <laughs> but I think Cobalt Gorge um, is just awesome in terms of their storytelling. And Cobalt Gorge is a long way from nowhere. You know, it's a long way from anywhere, I should say. Um, and they drag people out because of the storytelling. Um, you know, you talk about innovation. They've just put out a great new guest attraction there, which is this, this glass bridge that goes across the gorge. And I'm just seeing social media just being flooded with people that are actually on this bridge. The other one that I've got there is Paranella Park. Yeah. And I just think that they're so um, outside the box in terms of what we actually sell. But these guys have said, right, we're gonna take a Spanish castle in the middle of the rainforest. 
and we're going to turn this into one of the most visited drive destinations um, anywhere in Queensland. And this is what I'm saying. They have sold people on the story that they can tell. They've captured people's imaginations. And now people will absolutely deviate off the Bruce Highway to go and visit that product. That's the storytelling. That's the hook. Um, and that, for me, is how you do really do develop a really successful drive product um, and attract that drive market. Well, Bram, thank you for joining us to talk about the drive market. We'll have you back in a little while to talk uh, a little more closely about Andara. Before we thank move you, on, Bram. though, Michael, I think it would be great to spend a little time talking about being domestic trade ready, given that the domestic market is going to be where everybody's energy is. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this always comes down to, and this is what I was talking to about understanding your business. Um, understanding how far you can take your business, how deep you can actually go into certain channels is absolutely an understanding that you need to have for your business because to go all in on, on domestic trade and to be domestic ready, you need to have the ability to be able to pay commissions. That is 100% the oversight um, in terms of an understanding that yes, you need to do it. Whether it's online, whether it's more traditional wholesalers, the expectation is that yes, nobody is going to sell and promote your product for love. So mm. they're absolutely going to have to, um, or we as products are going to have to pay that commission. It varies depending on who you're talking to and everything like that as well. Um, and I've got to tell you that I'm not going to go into this deeply today. Um, there's some, some, uh, some stuff in the handouts that we do go into a little bit more deeply, but this is also a great topic if you do want to explore this to actually bring this up with your business coach um, in the business coaching sessions, because it's a very, very individualized strategy for each product in terms of who you're actually going to go and speak to and who it is that is actually out there. But the whole premise of this is that it gives you a much deeper and bigger marketing footprint than what you can achieve through your own direct sales, say through your websites or through telephone bookings or whatever it might be working and leveraging other partnerships and relationships out in the market gives you a much bigger chance to talk to a much bigger audience as well. And I think that is also a pretty smart strategy as we start going into um, really focusing on that domestic market. Well, speaking of which, that's a perfect opportunity, Michael, to give you a little break and we'll have you back a little later in the webinar and to reintroduce James back onto the panel. Um, James, if you're with us, you, of course, yeah, I mentioned all of the experience that you've had in the past and as now a major wholesaler, you've really been able to maintain the exposure in the market with Ignite Travel Group during this COVID time. I think it'd be really great to be able to have you share with us some of the learnings and some of the observations that you've seen over the last couple of months in particular when things have started to ramp back up again from an Ignite perspective. Yeah, look, thanks, Sophie. Look, there's there's many learnings and observations that we've seen over the last few months. I thought what I thought I'd do firstly is to provide maybe a little bit of background on Ignite Travel Group, particularly for the audience who doesn't know a lot about us. So we were founded in 2005. Um, we're headquartered here on the Gold Coast, and we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Flight Sound Group although we do operate as a completely independent business. We offer a unique platform, um, both a B2B um, opportunity plus a B2C environment. In our B2B environment, um, we distribute product to the likes of Flight Centre, logically. We also work with the likes of Flybys, NRMA, NRMA, as well as RAA, as well as entertainment book and also distribute product to Kogan. So that's a unique opportunity for potential partners out there. Now we do have a B2C platform, which is very successful and has been running for many years under the My Queensland banner. So that focuses purely on Queensland as a destination. In regard to landscape at the moment, it's, it's quite a unique yet landscape that we find ourselves within. It's uh, certainly unique, um, nothing that I've ever seen before, nothing that I'm sure anybody else has seen before. What I'd like to say around landscape is I'd break it into two different um, um, regions, let's say. It's the old landscape, and what I refer to there is really those customers of ours that haven't been able to travel over the last four months. 
So as you can imagine, thousands upon thousands of customers who had a holiday book to travel both within Australia and overseas who couldn't travel. And the things that we have to work through with those customers to hopefully get them on a holiday in the future. And then there's the new landscape. So this is all about how we're approaching new business and the things that we've had to do to adapt, adapt to try and um, get the customers out there to book. So it's quite a unique uh, situation that we have. The key thing for us as part of this is being that customer engagement. As things started to sort of go the way that it went, we were on the phone talking to those customers and working through those people or the issues associated with those bookings that were due to travel. And from a lot of those conversations, we've learned a lot of things along the way, particularly that's helped us frame up how we're addressing that new business opportunity. Now, when I talk about product innovation, what we've had to do particularly is to be a lot more flexible about how we're approaching our business and certainly flexible about the way that we are engaging with our customers to give them confidence about booking a holiday moving forward. Now, for us as a business, as you can imagine, our focus has, to, has had to shift from not only Queensland, but the rest of Australia. So we've got a much more domestic focus now in our business. Um, of course, we can't send our customers overseas, unfortunately. So as part of that change with expanding our domestic product range, we've been putting messages into market around flexibility. So people don't want to part with their dollars at the moment. Um, the environment is not uh, as positive it has been historically. So our messaging is about securing our new offers with minimal deposits or providing that flexibility to secure a booking by giving them the flexibility to cancel or rebook for later times. So we've had great success with that messaging and thankfully we've been able to secure a new business. So that's been um, certainly a great insight from our side. And what we've also had to do, as you can appreciate, with airlines not really flying at the moment, so to speak, our business has moved away from more of a, what we call an opaque package model, so flights, transfers, cars, accommodation, to land only. So we're selling more land only packages to, again, try and secure the new customer business and then addressing our flight situation at a later time. So a few little insights there on how we're addressing the business. But look, it's been, it's been a big learning curve, particularly also around destination focus for us as well. Within Queensland, traditionally, we've sold predominantly the East Coast. So those key leisure gateways. So Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, with Sundays, North Queensland. We've certainly had to diversify our product range across the state. Um, we normally would do that when we're working with the likes of Tourism Event Queensland. We do a lot of co-op activity and we do a lot of regional based activity with the likes of Tourism Tropical North Queensland. So for partners out in Queensland, there's many other opportunities than what we would normally focus on. One of the things that we are also doing, which I'm picking up a point on some of the earlier topics is the drive market. Traditionally, we've never really focused on suggesting self itineraries and self drive itineraries and the like. So we're actually promoting self drive itineraries for the first time really as a business as well. So a lot of, a lot of new learnings, a lot of new product opportunity and diversifying our messaging and product type is sort of being some of the things that we've been doing. In, in that area in particular where you're talking about, you know, moving into a space like the drive market that traditionally wouldn't be something you'd focus on, how have you then chosen the products that you'll work with? Because that's the interesting part of the story, you know, off the back of what Michael was talking about when it comes to pivoting, that if you as a wholesaler are looking for opportunities to send people on a drive, it means that you would also have a criteria for the products that you're going to be suggesting too. Yeah, look, you know, for us as a business um, in regard to product type, um, because of the nature of the style of business that we're in, we need certain minimums. So when I talk about certain minimums, it's about the scale of the size of the product and the ability for some of those products to offer things like static allotments, 
Um, they're pricing around a static rate environment, uh, things like value adds and those types of things. So we really look for products that have a little bit of size about them. But again, in this current environment, we are diversifying a lot. It's, it's about the experience and what we can offer our customers. So for example, in South East Queensland, we have a self-drive self itinerary from Brisbane to the Sunshine Coast by going to a small B&B style product on the Mullaney Hillside and then encompassing into the Sunshine Coast and then into Kingfisher Bay as an example. In North Queensland, we're doing things like with the Tablelands, Mission Beach, and then in, and finishing in a place like Palm Cove, a so flop and drop. So we're really sort of doing a little uh, few things differently, but some of those key components are still very important for us. The ideal situation is when we have that customer on the phone, we'd like to be able to convert there and then on the spot. So the ability to be able to, you know, secure by selling into a static allotment is critical for us as a business. So look, you know, for us, sorry. Sorry, Matt, I was just gonna say, and for anyone that's sort of like on the call where, if any of that language was foreign to you, like static allotments and pricing and dynamic pricing and all that sort of thing, if that's a foreign language to you, again, that's something that can be really taken up with the business coaching program as well. And any of the business coaches will be uh, able to sort of like shed some light on that one too. Yeah, look, absolutely. It's, it, it sometimes is a little bit uh, foreign, but as Michael said, your business coach or there's some information in the handouts. Um, look, really, Sophie, for us at the moment, it's going to be a very, very super competitive market, not only in Queensland, but across the, whole of, across the whole of the country. There's a lot more players coming into this environment. So for us as a business, it's critical. We have products that create that point of difference. It's about the experience side of that. So as, as, a, uh, as a product, whether it be an accommodation style product, or whether it be an experience, you know, for those people out there, don't be frightened to try something different. It's all in, it's very, very important at the, at the moment to stand out from the crowd, create that point of difference. If you don't have flexibility with your own business, please engage with a like-minded partner in your area to create that point of difference or something special. Um, it's going to be a super competitive market. We're all in it together, so hopefully we continue to grow the business in Queensland. Uh, but that's a little bit about us, what we're doing, some of those learnings. Um, so I hope that that's helped. Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a look at some of the channels that you guys uh, are working with for Ignite at the moment and, and, and some of the collateral that we can see that you have out there. So this is the sort of thing that you're talking about that gives a really clear idea of where you can go, what you can do when you get there and all the different um, ways that you're able to com communicate with potential customers and consumers. Yeah, look, absolutely. Some of those things that you're showing, particularly the item on the left are now on sale. So that's our My Queensland platform. So we really bundle a lot of experiences together. So that one in particular for North Queensland, you know, that will have flight component, but it'll also have transfer, outer reef, potentially a Cape Trib, as well as a lot of inclusions within the accommodation house. So it's what we term a holiday in a box I like to use, those people that are time poor like to pick something off the shelf. But we're evolving the product range, particularly in this current environment. And I know Michael has got a number of slides within the notes that show some of the other channels that I referred to before. So, you know, take a look at those and you'll get a sense of some of the things that we do. Fantastic. James, thank you. We'll have you back a little bit later. And as I Bid you farewell. I'll welcome Bram Collins back once again from um, Andara to have a chat with us about um, what they're doing up north. We've already touched on the fact that you're incredibly busy, um, but at the same time, you're well known to so many people because of, of obviously the, the physical place, those extraordinary lava tubes. But you've also had some incredible experiences with adding on to that and introducing events. Can you give us a little bit of an insight into why you decided to innovate into the space from being just a, a beautiful place to visit with some amazing stories to having a reason for people to come outside of those? Yes, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, the main reason that we uh, branched out into events uh, originally was due to the seasonality of tourism in our region. Uh, in North Queensland, we have a uh, 
uh, and in particular in the remoter areas in North Queensland, we have a very busy winter where a lot of the snowbirders from down south migrate north to uh, the warmer climate. Um, and so, you know, at Andara, we were seeing, we were seeing almost immediately from when we opened was that about 60% of our annual visitation was happening in winter. So June, July, August time. Um, and for the rest of the year, like we made good money over, over that, the, the winter time, but for the rest of the year, the business was a struggle. It was pretty marginal. And so we realized that we needed to develop something that would fill the property up, um, particularly over a long weekend. And if we could get a full place for three nights, um, it would take a month around. Uh, and so, you know, we started to look around at what the options were and uh, we thought we need to create an event. And uh, there were three parameters basically that we um, judged the success of our uh, our new event on, and the first thing it had to be something that no one else was doing up here. It had to be completely unique. The second is it had to appeal to an audience that had a high disposable income, and the third thing is it had to be something that we do on an annual basis. So we looked around, and you know, everyone had a country festival, little you know, rodeos and outback race meetings and that sort of stuff. And we heard of um, a concept that was run only once or twice in South Australia called Opera in the Outback and how it was very well supported. And uh, you just didn't hear of Opera up here in North Queensland, uh, maybe in Cairns and Townsville once or twice a year. But we decided that we could do this and it was uh, completely unique. It was something that uh, no one else was doing that for sure. We could do it every year and it would attract people that had a few dollars. So, um, in sorry, go ahead. So, I was just going to say, Bram, we're having a, a few problems with your connection there. You're sounding a little bit like Mork from Mork a few times and, and, and some of the <laughs> words aren't coming through. So, I'm not sure if Michael's popped back on to be able to speak on your behalf. Uh, Michael, is that what you were thinking? Bram yeah, seems look, to be I, okay now. The connection looks good again. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he starting to look okay again. You want to you want to give a test one, two, three there, Bramwell? Test one, two, three. I I need to yeah. pedal faster, do I? Under the desk. Yeah, here. I think so. I think so. Oh, sorry Either about that. that. Wind's blowing. Um, no, we, we, look, we we could catch we could catch enough of the words with I think the with the um with the 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 points on screen to to know where it was you were going. But I think if we could just head to this one where you're talking about the three main points of, of what it is you have to be thinking about in terms of how you create something so that it's different to what everyone else is offering. Yeah, completely. And that's it. It's got to be unique. It's got to be something that, again, appeals to a target market. And thirdly, it's got to be something that we, we could offer on an annual basis. And uh, we targeted operating back in uh, shoulder season, uh, post our business season. And uh, how are we going? Can you, can you still hear me? It's not great. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I'll let Michael be the puppet master. I know he's familiar enough with the work that you've done up there and, and you guys are great mates that maybe Michael, on behalf of Bram, you can pick up here. Um, you know, he, he talked about making sure that, that the experience appeals to an audience that has a high disposable income because obviously events are not a cheap thing to put on, particularly not in a, re a remote area. And the fact 100%. that it had to be something that was offered annually, because we know that the, the great thing about that is that you want it to be an event that creates enough of, a, of an incentive that people want to be there. They don't want to miss out. Well, I think that what they've done with their events out at Undara, and this is exactly why I asked Bram to come and speak today, is for, it, it's from a practical point of view. So this is someone that's incorporated events into their strategy. Um, they've used it so that they can create shoulders on either side of their main peak season. Um, and I think that that is just one of the key things um, why you would look at doing an event. And then I think about, you know, to his point there about having to be unique, um, opera in the outback. Just mm. think about that concept for a second. Opera in the outback. 
um, I don't know if, whether Brand was having a few drinks there one night and came up with that concept, but it was an absolute dead set cracker. Um, I've been to the Rock and Blues Festival um, and it is fantastic. And they've also incorporated that with a great Anzac Day um, ceremony that happens on that as well. So they've added dimensions now to this event. And while opera's kind of run its course, they've now come out with, um, with the Rockabilly Rods and Rides Festival, mm. which was supposed to come in this year, but COVID That's is sort true. of like maybe just, um, just challenged that a little bit. So that'll be back in 2021. But this is why I think that you would look to incorporate events is the fact that it does give you attendance um, and, and, and customers and clients and guests at a time when you, you, maybe you're starting to see it start to drop off. Mm. And this is why I think events, particularly what I call micro events, which is what I would call what Bram's up to, because he's incorporated this into his product. And this is why I think it's such an exciting thing for a product to consider, particularly if they do see that feast and famine, that cyclical um, seasonality that is sometimes just so prevalent within our industry as well. Mm. And, and there's Michael, so if you can hear me, if you can hear me, one of the other things that I would like to add is what the actual event does, the, the real value is in adding value to your brand story. Mm. And we talked about stories before. Um, it, it just stretches and molds your story. And, uh, you know, we, we tend to push the boundaries a little and do things that um, are unique and are different, but it, it suits our story. It supports the kind of image that Andara has. Mm. Um, just it, we we can hear you, Bram. So stay with us just for a little longer. If you can just finish up with what you thought were your three top tips. Well, you know, it, I'll I'll give you an example of of taking something that everyone does and making it a bit unique. Um, most accommodation properties offer a breakfast with their uh, accommodation. Um, breakfast is breakfast, you would think. At Andara, we took our breakfast and we just serve it in the bush. Um, it's uh, around two campfires. We uh, have trained the uh, kookaburras to steal your bacon every morning. All of that, uh, there's no table cost. There's no having to sweep up. The birds will take care of all of that. You cook your own toast over the fire, Billy tea, brewed coffee, and it is a really special experience that that we offer bush breakfast and you know people see it as one of their highlights and it was just taking something everyone does and trying to apply your story to it um, and I think that's uh, everybody can do that we all have a story you just need to find out what it is that you can celebrate um, that maybe other people can't. It might be your own history. It might be an anniversary. It could be an event you create like we've spoken about. But but you can take this, this product you create, put your stamp on it, and all of a sudden, it's something special. Uh, mm. And if when you build it, there's a fair chance when people come to it, there's an economic benefit to your community. So try and involve your community in this and it builds the win-win for everyone in the community. And as I said to you, once you can demonstrate community benefit, then the funding bodies and that are a lot more open to supporting and investing in some of these ideas. And you look around at, at the huge effect that, um, you know, things like uh, way out west had out in Winton and uh, some of those businesses out there, they, those businesses, the Qantas Founders Museum, Stockman's Hall of Fame, the uh, Walsham Matilda Centre, all of these places, um, you know, have created this massive benefit for the community out there because of their, their, they're not looking sort of inward, they're looking outward. I think it's a great lesson to us all. Oh, absolutely. It's one of Amanda's favourite catchphrases, partner or perish, right? Bram, yeah. thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you were able to um, to finish off there. 
uh, I will let you, you go for just a minute and bring Michael back to um, to really wrap this all into, you know, as you mentioned, Michael, um, a, a case study. We have covered a lot of ground over the last hour or so, and you have got this great example for us of how all the information we've talked about can really be tied together. Absolutely. And this is, I just wanted to, to give a practical example. Um, you know, take some of it, take all of it, take none of it. It's just something that we have absolutely experienced as we've ridden this roller coaster of, of COVID. And this was a resort that we spoke to in the middle of April and they had completely shut down. They had heavy exposure into the international market. And I think that's probably something that a lot of products can absolutely relate to that might be on this webinar right now. Um, so what we did was we developed basically um, a plan for them to re-emerge. And we did a little bit of crystal balling. We identified the markets that were, uh, that were going to come online we curated the offer to those particular markets. Um, we started looking a little bit further down the track to other markets that might start opening up as well. Again, develop the offer. And then we started to develop the channels where we were actually going to start pushing that out. And as we fast forward into, um, into, uh, into this event, and as I said, we're still not out of this yet. This is, that strategy has absolutely enabled this resort to emerge and emerge pretty successfully as well. Um, again, remember that these guys were coming off pretty well a scratch start. They had not a lot of bookings on their system. And by incorporating this sort of thinking, they have really managed to do some great stuff down at that resort. In the background, while we were sort of like doing the marketing side of things, they were also working on their guest experience. And this was the restaurant that I was alluding to before. So they took their restaurant that was previously just the restaurant at the resort and they gave a restaurant a brand new identity. They brought their staff in, the staff created the identity, the staff really, I guess, curated um, what they wanted to offer their guests and they've gone through with it. Um, they've taken a whole new element from paddock to plate um, and given that a massive amount of exposure um, within their dishes that they're offering and it's just been a huge success. And what they have done is really, I guess, from a, a um, I guess, from a profitability point of view, is that they've really added to the overall discretionary spend within the actual resort, because they've taken it from the restaurant, then they've taken it right through to the bar as well. So this is what I was saying about an innovation where they've absolutely recreated the guest experience, not at a huge cost. Um, as I said, the tables and chairs are still exactly the same. They haven't gone for that capital thing but they've used some, um, some innovative thinking to recreate that guest experience. And I think that's just a really fantastic example of how that, um, how that can actually flow as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and in the notes, I should point out too, um, we've given you a complete insight into all the channels that we used to push this particular product out into the market. Like we really did go um, and really give you a very, very in-depth case study on this particular one as mm. well. Well, we have covered a lot of ground today and I know that there were some questions that came in um, before that, before, before time, a, a few of which you've been able to touch on in your answers today. I'd love to invite uh, Bram and James to come back online if we can before we wrap up this afternoon. If you have any further questions, it's probably best to just email them through to the QTIC team and they'll make sure that they go to the right people to have them answered. I would love to give each of you gentlemen just an opportunity to sort of wrap up. As I mentioned, we, you know, we're talking about looking at a product and how it can be looked at in a different way, how everyone can to look at what they're doing and innovate so that they are able to be nimble at a time when we're all required to embrace change. I'd love you each to just finish off by maybe either giving us a top tip or a top takeaway or sort of one of those mantras that you find yourself either internally having to say or, or something that you can hear yourself telling other people within the industry over and over to help get them through um, this COVID time. James, would you like to kick off? Yeah, sure. Look, for me, it's all about flexibility. As I touched on before, we've really had to change the way that we do things and create uh, the essence of with customers that they that we can be flexible. You're not locked in. It gives people a little bit of comfort. So flexibility certainly is one of the biggest points. You know, from a product point of view, you know, look outside the box, create something that's different. 
create an experience that uh, will make you stand out from the crowd. It's going to be a super competitive market as we continue to come out of this uh, COVID situation, but yeah, that's a thing. Flexibility, create that story as people have said, and the experience. Graham, have you got something you'd like to add? Yeah, Sophie, thank you. I think uh, in this uncertain time, if you're struggling, get help. Um, ask for help. No one knows your business like you do, but put together a dynamic team, not just yourself, to find real solutions. Measure everything that you spend money on. Make sure you get a return on investment. And if you don't, dump it and move to a to do a better idea. But number one, ask for help if you're struggling. Michael, I'm sure that you've had a lot of people come to you with that exact question. Have you got something you'd like to finish us off on this afternoon? Yeah, look, for my mind, it is it has been um, the ability to be nimble. That is exactly the thing at the moment. Benchmarking yourself on what has been and the stuff that happened last year, and this is what we've always done, is not necessarily a relevant conversation right now. Um, we are not through this roller coaster. Um, and the ability to, to recognise the audience that you can talk to um, and understand that audience and then go out there and meet the market um, so that you can give yourself an absolute crack at getting those people into your product, into your accommodation. Um, and I would just say be prepared to adopt and to adapt. Um, and I think that that's probably just another thing that I would say, be flexible, be open. Um, to things you may not have had to do it in the past, but you may not. You may just need to do it right here and right now, given the environment that we're in right now. Yeah, and exactly what Bram just mentioned that you know you can try something, and if it doesn't work, dump it and try something else. But not doing anything is not the answer, right? It's that yeah. is for sure. We are in one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging, environment that tourism has ever seen. And we just need to be aware of, of the factors that can influence our business right now. Gentlemen, thank you so much to you, Bram, to James, and of course, Michael from Pinnacle for being with us this afternoon. As we've mentioned before, and I will remind you all that if you'd like to register for the next webinar and the online coaching, head to Queensland Tourism Industry Business Capability Development Program by visiting the QTIC Business Capability website. This webinar and the other recorded webinars will also be available for you to be able to view there on the QTIC website. Domestic trade and distribution is our subject next week, July 29th. I hope that many of you are able to join us then. Can I say thank you to the Queensland Government, the Queensland Tourism Industry Council, Tourism and Events Queensland and the 13 regional tourism organisations for their support of this program. This initiative is proudly funded and supported by the Queensland Government through its Tourism Industry Business Capability Development Program. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful and safe evening. Thank you.